are finally valuing the rest of their business. Like for the longest time, they did completely the energy wasn't included in it, which is insane. Do you, do you think that's what's happening? Do you think that's why the stock's up? I was at work all day today, so I don't know exactly what happened today. I just saw that it went up. I just mean in general, like over the last, because I've been trying to figure out over the last what. It four looks months, like it what, looks like this year what, that they have they have started to finally put some numbers to the rest of the business. I I think it's kind of uh, that that it's been depressed for such a long time, mm -hmm. and it just seems like like a, a number of analysts switched or started to switch. And it just oh, seems out. like many other people jumped on board along with it, and it's mm -hmm. it's swelled like it, it's like a pendulum switch. It's uh, it went too far one way, mm -hmm. and now uh, people have switched and and got on board, and it's it's just progressed in that direction, maybe too far the other way. But Are it's it's an interesting that that it was almost like the tide coming in and the tide going out, uh, and it, it literally in in the in the in the span of time for a uh, stock momentum, it, it was a really short time for it to, it, to it's switch. It's like the, before the big tsunami that goes out and then right. comes in and <laughs> takes out everybody. And everybody <laughs> runs down to the beach and says, woo, this is fun, this is fun. Yeah. yeah. But is it is it done swinging yes. any other way? Or are we in mid-swing? Yes. How far are we? Oh. <laughs> yeah. And if, I, if I knew that, I wouldn't be on this show. <laughs> Right, right. That's Patrick. The nine hundred seventeen dollar question. Yeah, um, yeah, and you know, you, there there are some good points, and you know, and, and in the interview on on Bloomberg, um, Ed brought up the point that you know this Tesla, we we can no longer really refer to Tesla as a startup because they're um, they went IPO in two thousand ten, right? So we know that they're at least ten years old. So they operate like a startup. But a 10-year-old company, I think, is, uh, is beyond the startup phase. But there was the question about the stock being suppressed. So is it that for the first 10 years, or let's say nine and a half years, no one believed the story? You know? Or, I mean, yeah, many fewer people. So certainly, Musk has said himself there were multiple occasions where they were within single-digit uh, weeks of death. And so there were a lot of people predicting their demise, and that could have happened. Now it's pretty obvious that they are able to make cars, and they can capitalize easily. They have access to money. They just raised another $2 billion recently, and the market rewarded them for that because it looks like it's going to allow them to grow faster, perhaps a Texas gigafactory. Uh, so I, I think... The main reason I think the stock has jumped is that a lot of people now see them not as on the edge of death and that they will be long-term successful. Um, that makes sense. And, and part of it, I think, is they put a leash on Elon, so he's he's not making these crazy claims like he used to. Did they really? <laughs> yeah. They did? He matured a little wow. bit. Yeah, it's, all, it's all relative, right? <laughs> all right. Compared it's to what he it's one of those elastic <laughs> leashes, I think. Yeah. 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 You know what? I have a question. So uh, uh, for Ed, watching the Bloomberg TV thing, Kathy Wood from ARK Invest uh, was going off on the reasons why Tesla is going to continue to grow. And one of them was that her short-term prediction was that it was going to – that Tesla would see a 40% uh, margin – in their vehicles, in their, I, I, where does that come from? So, so, does anyone ever see a 40% so, margin in, in vehicles? Didn't they so uh, she, she, she covered where it came from and she mentioned it multiple times with Wright's Law that as your economies Which, of scale grow, your cost of production decreases and that they are on a technology curve. Uh, so no one is making batteries at the scale that they are and that they're going to ride that cost curve down. They're leading in that area. The, they've, the recent high bar acquisition is going to allow them to automate more of that production. And uh, so, so you, can, you can look at the cost of batteries over the last decade, and they've, they've dropped significantly. And uh, that looks like it's going to continue into the next decade. That's the, one of the biggest costs for their vehicles, and that's going to uh, reduce significantly, which will allow them to have more profit on their vehicle or sell them at a lower cost opening up a larger market, leading to more revenue. But there's we're, a we're there's really a logical good. there's a logical leap there though, right? Because um, okay, so like let's accept that battery costs are coming down. Uh, by the way, we're still way off where they projected, right? I think uh, uh, Elon predicted that the hundred 
a dollar per kilowatt hour at the pack level was going to be last year or something like that. And it doesn't seem like they're actually actually there yet. But whatever, let's say let's assume it keeps going down. Vertically integrating into that business uh, is not going to help their margins, right? Getting into a commodity business, like, okay, maybe it helps their margin in the car, but they've got a lot of capital that's going to go into making this thing that is that is that prices are being depressed on, right? But also by doing that in-house, they only get to leverage the scale uh, of batteries that are going into their cars. Whereas if you go with a supplier who's selling to multiple companies, yes, that company is going, the supplier is going to take a margin, but they also get scale from selling to multiple EV makers. Um, and so in theory, right, if, if scale is such a powerful uh, uh, force here, um, it seems like that's an argument against vertical integration. Except that their scale is bigger than the entire market combined right now. Also, and they're not doing just vehicles. Exactly. And uh, what were they at before the Model Three launch? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. How many power walls are they selling? A lot. Yeah, well, um, right now they're battery constraints. How right? many? Which is why they're building out. Don't uh, forget about the power packs. packs. How yeah, many? Forget about power packs. How many? If they're battery constrained, why haven't they built out the Giga? Like, why is the Giga factory still not? the the picture that they showed us when they launched that thing right like if that's yeah. if it's battery can right that's a choice they could invest in but but in don't that forget either. that even though it's, it's not as big as they said it would be it is also putting out what uh three times more than it should should have when it was completed i mean they're at what or not three times uh two times they were, they were they were what they had originally contracted with panasonic for right but they were saying 35 and now they're saying 50 at, at, at its current size it they're not actually producing 50, though. I have no clue. Uh, and But it's interesting, too, because right now we also have news that they're um, going to be going with CATL um, yeah. for their Chinese ones, and they're actually going to be used lithium iron phosphate batteries. Um, and, and so, no, that's, that's I mean, my sourcing seems pretty pretty clear on that. It's going to be for uh, their sort of the, the Chinese market standard range, their more affordable, their most affordable Model 3. Uh, it's going to use these uh, lithium ion phosphate. Um, and, and that's interesting to me because like now, you know, this story that the Gigafactory was going to be the source of all this scale that was going to drive down all this cost. And by, you know, building we, we all these a trade war after that, one place, now, now it's like, you're not even, you're not just not building them at the, at the, at the Gigafactory, which, okay, fine. But you're also not building them in the 2170 uh, uh, form factor. You're also not building them at the, the uh, in, in the same chemistry, which would provide scale, uh, where what really matters, which is the the feed stocks that go into it, that's where the scale, that's where the cost really needs to come out, and that's where the scale could could make a difference. But they're not doing so. Like this, you know, it's fine. Like I'm not saying this is, you know, any of this is disastrous. It, it makes sense to me. I understand why they're doing it. It's just that, you know. Uh, I remember as, as sort of a historian of this company and having written a book about it, I remember what the story was um, and everyone believed it then. It was, yeah, it's definitely the way it's going to happen. And now, you know, as the story changes, there's no, it's like the certainty, the story changes and the certainty of, uh, of confidence in what the story is right now never changes. And that to me, like, strikes me as problematic. It, it strikes me as there's a lack of, uh, analytical rigor going into how people are are just looking at this company, and and whether you like them or don't, um, you know, analytical rigor is good. In fact, if you support a company, right, you should they, you should they should be able to withstand some uh, some analytical rigor. And I just don't see that around this company, which is the, you know. the story should change though, as as you get new data, as you get like you get blowout sales on the Model Three, Model Y, Cybertruck, <laughs> you should adjust your ability to produce. Oh, yeah, so can we? Two and we did get into there. a trade it's, war after after they announced Giga One. You, you can't call them blowout sales if they're supposed to be eight hundred thousand. Like the the story was also they're going to make eight hundred thousand units this year. They're not going to do that. They're going to be lucky to make five hundred thousand. Well, everybody's Chinese factory shut down for a couple of weeks. No, not because of like no because they were supposed <laughs> to make eight. Apple, they were most supposed, they were supposed to make eight hundred thousand units out of Fremont this year. Actually, last year they said they were going to make eight hundred thousand in in or. Five five hundred and twenty. Anyway, whatever. The point is, is that their the story continues to change, and to claim that now sales are like blowing away what expectations were a couple of years ago, when in fact they're much much less than Elon was projecting them to be a couple of years ago. It's just let's just be like let's stick with the the facts. Yeah, and well, the fact is that Musk is a master at controlling the narrative. 
and exciting the masses but that are in the Tesla army and uh, and that is a rallying cry and and it's more about the goal and the destination than what numbers were this quarter or last quarter or even last year uh, so having that ability to have a, a rallying cry and a, a great goal and uh, inspirational is uh, important yeah and, and, and he's really good at over promising and under delivering so, so, so actually, no. just one one thing that I think is really interesting um, that plays into this loyalty question because I think you're absolutely right, Patrick. I think uh, you know the people people always ask me like, oh, don't you don't you feel bad about getting everything so ba- so badly wrong about Tesla? Look at their their stock price and stuff, and and uh, they're still around. And I always say what I what I underestimated was Musk's ability to get people to continue to pump money into this company because that's been the factor that's kept the company alive. Yes. It's required other yep. things, but that's been the deciding factor. Okay, so something very interesting. I got um, I got my hands on a copy of the Reputation.com uh, 2020 Automotive Report. Uh, it's quite interesting, um, and it's, this is just one metric, and you know their methodology is what it is. Um, they've been doing it for a long time. I'm not saying this is the the absolute gospel, but it does track for me what I see uh, sort of trends in in the forum. Uh, forums, really mostly TMC as the biggest one, but but elsewhere as well, which is that like there does seem to be among owners. Now, investors are happier with Musk than ever, right? For good, obvious reasons. Uh, the owners, however, I think one of the reasons that Tesla has been able to turn out these these fairly consi- surprisingly consistently consistent uh, quarterly profits is because uh, things are no longer as white glove and generous as they were on the service side, um, in, in part just because of you know, they're not doing the Ranger stuff as much, but in part two, they just, they scaled up their volume and didn't really scale up their service footprint as, uh, alongside it. Um, so, uh, reputation.com, um, they, they're, they have a whole little section on it, uh, on, on Tesla, their, their reputation, according to these metrics and, and, and how they do it is, is some of the worst in the business, uh, particularly on service and they particularly call out their service, um, they have a negative two percent service reputation score, uh, and negative eleven percent speed of service. Whatever. There's these different metrics, but but it's and I posted some of this stuff, um, Twitter.com/slash/tweetermar if you want to see it. But it's it's genuinely bad, and 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 to me that's something that I look at and I say, well, you know, that's Musk pissing off that core army. And I've seen for a long time that investors and and owners have kind of slightly different interests. Clearly, right. Um, and as that gap widens, um, I start to wonder what kind of effect that'll have on what, what we agree is the most important thing Tesla has, which is that ability to like the loyalty, right? Right. So that, that, that is true. And it's a solvable problem. The question is, will they solve it before they end up shooting themselves in the foot? I mean, we've talked about that on here, but Paul, uh, uh, why doesn't Tesla allow you to, uh, do repairs? Exactly. Also, the Ranger program is scaled up. Uh, there's four Rangers that I've met in my town. Um, they try to do as much as they can mobile just to keep you out of the service center. Well, um, we have more stuff to talk about. I just want to wrap mm-hmm. this up. Um, that was fun. Saying, um, yeah, yeah, wrap it up real quick by saying um, Ed um, hates automated looms. Um, <laughs> the rest of you, you nice. belong to Colt. All right. So I think we're done. Yes. No, um, it, it is absolutely fascinating. And I know the people watching this recorded video are right now uh, typing in all caps. And, uh, <laughs> and that's awesome because we love the, uh, the back and forth. We love hearing from our, um, our viewers. Uh, just remember, um, it's at Tweetermeyer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for nice that. handoff. Yes. So my my mentions a- weren't enough of a disaster <laughs> as it is. Yes. Um, Altonacast is a fascinating podcast. If you are not subscribed to Altonacast, uh, you need to. Um, it's, it's very noticeable. You will recognize it's a white icon with a very small A, um, underappreciated um, um, icon. And listen to it. You will learn so much about um, autonomous vehicles. So there's only two podcasts you need to pay attention to, Altonacast and this one. Not in any particular order, but us first. Okay.